Good morning. I am Ben Ayers, Dean of the Terry College of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Terry Third Thursday. This is our monthly event every third Thursday of the month. Uh, we are here at our Executive Education Center, which is the home of our Executive MBA program, our Professional MBA program, as well as our Executive programs that we do for companies in Atlanta and across the Southeast and beyond. Uh, this series is organized by our alumni board uh, and would like to thank them for organizing today's event as well as the entire series for this year, which has been outstanding. I would also like to thank our sponsors, our corporate sponsor, Synovus, the bank of here, uh, as well as our media sponsors, Atlanta Journal Constitution and Public Broadcasting Atlanta WABE. So please join me in thanking our sponsors. So I want to mention our uh, upcoming Terry Third Thursday speakers. So on May 17th, uh, we'll have Kirby Smart. You probably have heard of him. He is a uh, head football coach at the University of Georgia, so we're pleased to have him next month. And then in June, we'll have Paul Bowers, who is the CEO of Georgia Power. So this has been a great series this year, and we're going to finish strong before we break in July. Um, for Terry College, more broadly, busy time of the year for us. Next Saturday, we'll have our Alumni Awards in Gala. That will be at the Intercontinental Hotel. And then, just a few days after that, in Athens, we'll have our Terry Convocation uh, at Stegman Coliseum, which is at 2 o'clock. Before that, the university will have their graduate commencement, also at Stegman. And then later that evening, we'll be between the hedges for the undergraduate commencement uh, that evening as well. So this is a busy time, a year for all of us uh, in Atlanta as well as in Athens. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, this morning's speaker, Steve Fisher. Steve is the president and CEO of Novellus. His topic uh, today is going to be Novellus, the biggest company in Atlanta that you've never heard of. Uh, and those are his words, not mine, okay? So uh, we don't make it um, a practice of insulting our speakers, <laughs> at least before they speak. Um, so Novellus is the global leader in aluminum flat rolled products and the world's largest recycler of aluminum. It is a $10 billion company with 24 facilities in 10 countries and they employ roughly 12,000 people. Novella supplies premium aluminum sheet and light gauge products to several markets, including beverage can, automotive, and specialty markets uh, throughout North America, Europe, Asia, and South America. So they've got great coverage. Throughout his career, Steve has held significant roles in finance and accounting, strategic planning, and business development. He joined Novellus in 2006, following 13 years of consulting with or as part of management teams in various energy companies. He served as vice president and controller of TXU Energy, the non-regulated subsidiary of TXU Corp, which is headquartered in Dallas, Texas. At Novellus, Steve has served in a number of executive positions, most recently CFO before he took over the reins as CEO. During his tenure as CFO, the company invested approximately $2 billion to transform and to grow its business. Steve has also served as Vice President of Strategic Planning and Corporate Development, where he spearheaded major strategic, corporate, and financial transactions across the company. Most notably, the discussions that led to the acquisition of Novellus by Hindukal in 2007. Steve is a member of the Business Roundtable. It's an association of leading U.S. companies to, that promote sound public policy, which is always a good thing. He is also a member of the Board of Directors of the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, where he chairs the Global Commerce Council. Steve received his bachelor's degree in finance and accounting from Iowa, and he is a, CF, a CFA. So please join me in welcoming Steve Fisher. Thank you. Uh, good morning. And uh, thank you, uh, Dean Ayers, for that wonderful uh, introduction. And I found out from John that I've been sandwiched in between a great session uh, last month with Ed Bastian and then Kirby Smart, obviously, uh, coming next month. So I'll do my best to, to, to hold it up. Um, uh, wonderful uh, Terry uh, Third Thursdays. Uh, uh, very honored to be here with you this morning, um, as Dean Ayers said, to share with you 
a little bit about a very large company called Novellus that is right here uh, in, uh, in Atlanta. So uh, honored to be with you this morning. So by uh, show of hands, who has been to uh, the beautiful new Mercedes-Benz uh, Stadium uh, this past season? So many, many, many of you. A uh, beautiful stadium. And I wonder how many of you have looked up at the beautiful halo as you <laughs> stood there and looked at this and saw Novellus and said, scratched your head and thought, who the heck is Novellus? Uh, certainly, uh, we're not uh, the, 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 the biggest brands uh, in Atlanta. Uh, I get it, we're not Coca-Cola, we're not Home Depot, um, but my goal today is to educate you all on who Novellus is and certainly hopeful that when you go back to the stadium and uh, you're, you're watching uh, in either a United game or a Falcons game and this comes up again, you'll be in a place to educate uh, the person standing next to you that's going to be scratching their head. So, uh, it seems like a lofty goal, but actually I don't think it's actually all that lofty. Um, certainly everyone knows this brand uh, right here in the hometown, but everywhere around the world. What you probably don't know is that Novellus actually supplies 95% of all the aluminum to Coca-Cola here in North America. And for those of you that like something a little bit stronger, <laughs> AB InBev is another significant customer uh, of Novellus. And quite frankly, we actually supply pretty much every uh, beverage, uh, 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 can filler, um, and can maker uh, around the world. 40%, 40% of all beverage cans uh, in North America are made out of Novellus aluminum. And one out of every three globally are made out of Novellus aluminum, a significant global position in beverage can. But Novellus isn't just about beverage cans. We're about supplying aluminum to beautiful vehicles. Uh, uh, here you see the flagship vehicle of uh, Land Rover, uh, the, the Range Rover. 100% uh, of this is Novellus aluminum. We've been working with Jag Land Rover for decades around bringing aluminum into their vehicles. Um, you see a lot of these around Buckhead. I can't tell you how proud I am when I see one of these and I know, absolutely know, all that aluminum uh, on that vehicle, which is a lot, is coming from our, our uh, factories in Europe. We took 900 pounds of weight off the Range Rover, it gave it better performance from a braking standpoint, allowed them to bring the engine size down but have the exact same performance and made it even safer than the previous uh, steel version. Uh, so a, a, a big customer to us. We also supply, for, we have been supplying for decades to our new neighbor down at the uh, airport, Porsche. Um, again, um, a, a, a strong customer of Novellus. But it's not just about these European uh, high-end vehicles, they are, aluminum is coming here in North America as well. Uh, three years ago, Ford launched an aluminum intensive F-150 uh, and Super Duty, and Novellus has the largest share supply of aluminum onto this vehicle. Now this is quite significant uh, for many reasons. Um, they sell over a hundred vehicles per hour. Think about that. Every minute more than one truck is rolling off a lot somewhere, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. 900,000 F-150s alone, plus the Super Duties uh, sold in 2017. We took 700 pounds of weight off this vehicle. We made the performance, the towing performance better, the braking performance better. Uh, the overall safety rating went up. Uh, only five-star rated, uh, five rated safety truck in the marketplace. Um, it is the uh, highest selling, uh, best selling truck for 40 straight years um, and, and a significant relationship uh, for us. But it's not just Detroit and European, it's also electric vehicles. Here you see a beautiful Tesla Model 3. They have struggled to get production up, but I do believe they'll get them up. Um, when you think about electric vehicles, in order to get the, the range that consumers want out of electric vehicle. To put in all of the electronics and gadgets that you want to put into electric vehicles that consumers want, uh, that you need from a safety standpoint, you need to lightweight the vehicles. 
Um, and the best way, the best way to lightweight these vehicles to get um, the distance um, from the actual OEMs themselves is aluminum. And so um, you can see a, a significant amount of aluminum going to, into these electric vehicles here uh, in Tesla. Uh, but even a bigger play for us is in China, where the Chinese government, for uh, regulatory purposes, is trying to leapfrog the combustion engine. They want to be the leaders in electric vehicles, and they will be the leaders in electric vehicles. They put the infrastructure in in China. They are pushing OEMs to, to, to move in this direction. And here, you see one of our strategic partners, a company called NEO. This is um, their, the first model they rolled out this past fall called the ES8, seven, uh, seven seat SUV that actually has the performance of the Tesla model uh, X and uh, S. Um, fantastic vehicle, selling very well right now in, in China. So again, just a huge, huge opportunity for uh, aluminum sheet going into penetrating autos. But it's not just beverage cans and autos. Um, we also sell uh, many, many other products that we put under a banner called specialty products. It's building and construction, it's um, uh, electronics, it's industrial uh, applications of, uh, of aluminum. Um, here you, um, I'm sorry, uh, well, I'm sorry, go back here. We sell um, to 225 current models of automobiles on the road today. Uh, so basically we have a relationship with just about every uh, auto manufacturer in the world. Here you see um, uh, the Titanic Museum in Belfast, Ireland. And what you see is the facade of this is 100% novellus aluminum. This um, uh, is a beautiful building, but it's more than just beauty. It's um, the aluminum has attributes of um, uh, deflecting light to absorbing uh, energy and, and actually providing a benefit to bring uh, buildings to LEED certification. So uh, we see a huge application here. And then also, um, everyone has, uh, probably in this room, uh, one of these, if not more. And if you look at the back of these, you'll see that beautiful aluminum. And most likely, you're looking at Novellus aluminum because Novella sells to uh, many consumer electronics brands, including Apple, LG, Samsung, and the likes. Uh, so again, uh, another uh, area that we're in. But Novellus isn't just about all the aluminum that we're selling to our customers. It's also about the aluminum that we bring into Novellus. Um, as Dean Ayers said, we are the largest recycler of aluminum in the world. Uh, we recycle 65 billion used beverage cans on an annual basis at Novellus. Um, and it's a huge, huge um, uh, part of our business. We bring in 50, now 50, we used to 10 years ago have about 25% of all of our metal inputs came from recycled uh, aluminum. We've moved that up to 55%, moving closer to 60% of all of our aluminum uh, that we purchase being from recycled aluminum. And why is that important? Because when you bring in recycled aluminum, you use 95% less energy than if you were to smelt primary aluminum. And 95% less energy means 95% less greenhouse gas emissions going into the environment, which is huge for our customers, which is huge for the environment itself, um, and something that we're very, very proud of. It's not just, though, about used beverage cans. We find many, many ways to get recycled content back into, uh, in, into Novellus. And we've set up the two, two of the two largest, what we call closed loop recycling systems uh, in the world, one with Ford and one with Jag Land Rover. And so what we mean by that is when we deliver our uh, aluminum coils to Ford, we take it in a truck. They take the coils, they stamp their uh, parts out of that coil, whether it be for doors, hoods, fenders, whatnot. About 40 to 60% of that aluminum hits the floor. Ford traditionally would take that and just sell it into scrap markets, and it would get uh, pushed into back into steel or, or different uh, types of uh, products. What we've done with Ford and JLR is continue to segregate that scrap. The truck that drops off the coil goes to the other side of the stamping plant, picks up the scrap, brings it right back to our plant. We remelt it, make another coil out of it, and send it back to Ford. This allows Ford to make an additional 30,000 F-150s per month out of recycled aluminum coming back in the, 
coming back from their plants through ours. At um, JLR, we've been able to collect 50,000 metric tons already in this closed loop uh, recycling system, which is equivalent to 200,000 XE body sh body, uh, bodies, or 500,000, reduced 500,000 greenhouse gas emissions going back into the environment. So huge, huge benefit to, again, to our customers and to the environment as a whole. We're not just proud of uh, what we do with recycling. That is a huge part of what Novellus does uh, for society as a whole. But there's many other things that we do um, across the world in the communities and neighborhoods that, that, that we exist in. Here in Atlanta, you can see some of the areas that we are very much focused on. And we do focus uh, our, our time and effort around uh, STEM, uh, safety, um, uh, initiatives uh, inside of our communities. And here you can see that um, we're ad, uh, huge um, uh, advocates of the we uh, West Side Future Fund. Uh, we build a house uh, every year in a rapid build with Habitat. Uh, we build it in one week. It's a great event for uh, our employees to come out to. Uh, we also build a, a house with uh, the Atlanta Falcons in trying to get the recycled content back out of the stadium, collect that, and, and build a house uh, with that, which is a, a great event. Uh, huge supporters of um, FIRST Robotics, where we um, actually take our time and effort and, and help um, uh, the students uh, also provide the aluminum to, to build their robots. This is, you know, really a young generation learning about technology, engineering, mathematics. Great program there. And smaller uh, with uh, AGAP down on Marietta Boulevard, where you know, uh, we help with uh, younger uh, children in uh, underserved uh, communities and, and uh, another great initiative. So these are just a few. We're hugely proud of what we do at Novellus. Uh, we got great people that want to get out in the community and, and really is uh, something that's core to, to who Novellus is. So um, Dean Ayers went through this a little bit. Just so some statistics on Novellus. We are right here. We are right down the street, our world headquarters at, at uh, uh, two Alliance, right on the corner of 400 and Linux. Uh, uh, we have about 600 employees uh, in the Atlanta community. Uh, between our global headquarters, our North American headquarters are based here, and then we have our Global Research and Technology Center up in Kennesaw. Um, we uh, have uh, approximately 12,000 employees throughout 10 countries, um, 24 facilities, uh, revenues greater than 10 billion, uh, EBITDA from a, a kind of a financial metric greater than 1.2 billion dollars, uh, a very, very healthy business. As you think about who Novellus is in, in our industry, uh, we are the world's leader. We have 17% share of the global flat roll products market. We have one third uh, share of the beverage can market on a global basis. And currently, we have almost 50% share in the automotive space. We truly were the first mover from an innovation and technology standpoint uh, uh, in that space. How we stack against our competitors, it wouldn't surprise you with that market share that we are uh, two times larger than the next competitor on the page. Uh, we are the, the leader by far as it relates to uh, fat rolled aluminum uh, products. And we continue to grow. Uh, Dean Ayers tar talked about the two billion that, that we spent uh, while I was uh, CFO. We continue to invest. We just announced an investment uh, in January where we will put a greenfield facility into Kentucky, Guthrie, Kentucky, with state-of-the-art uh, 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 processes to serve our auto customers, uh, auto sheet, primarily auto customers in the south, uh, southeast region here. Uh, so we do continue to grow, continue to look for more opportunities, and I think uh, we'll continue to, to, to be in a great uh, place. The product portfolio has shifted over the last eight to nine years quite dramatically. We uh, try and always be in high-end, uh, high conversion uh, margin business. Uh, auto and beverage can certainly provide that to us. Um, and so you can see where we've moved out of the foil space, which became a, a bit of a commodity. Uh, certainly uh, a lot of imports coming in from China uh, and moved dramatically into the auto space, moving up from 4% back in 2009 to 18%. Uh, 
Uh, we will get that to 25% here in the next uh, few years as we just uh, ramp up the current assets in the ground and we'll continue to move uh, further uh, with, with auto. We want to keep CAN in that space of 50 to 60% because beverage CAN business is very recessionary resistant. So we think the product portfolio mix is very important. When we saw the 08, 09 crisis occur, our beverage CAN business did not uh, come back because what happens is consumers, instead of drinking at restaurants, decide to bring it home and they bring it home in the form of six packs and 12 packs and drink at home. So it is a, a nice uh, counter cyclical business to be in uh, during downturns. We have our headwinds though too, the no, no business uh, 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 doesn't. We have, you know, obviously um, uh, great performance and with great customers and uh, great people at, uh, at Novellus, but we do have to deal with the same thing everyone else does. In our case, um, some of the headwinds that we see out there, if you look around the tables just this morning, um, is the PET uh, water. Everyone wants to be healthier now, primarily uh, in North America. You see this trend towards healthier drinks, particularly water. And for whatever reason, people want to consume water out of a PET bottle. They want to see it. You trust it when it's something else, when it's Coke, when it's beer. But for some reason, we don't trust it when it's water. I guess because I, I can't explain it, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll continue to work with our uh, customers to see if we can get that uh, change. So that's a bit of a headwind. So we have to continually work with our uh, customers on finding new uh, package types so that we can compete with things like uh, these PET bottles that are on the table today. Steel's fighting back. We took the, prime, the, the highest, margin uh, highest margin business from them on the auto uh, sector. They were shocked when Ford went to all aluminum F-150. I gotta tell you, they're fighting back hard. hard. They have ultra high strength steel uh, applications that they're gonna come back and try and take our, uh, the business back uh, from Ford. We think we'll hold that business obviously, uh, but a lot of innovation that we have to get into to continue to advance our properties within uh, our materials too to uh, continue that strong growth and penetration of aluminum. Of course, CAFE standards, you've seen the administrations move back, uh, potentially to, to roll back some of the CAFE standards in the United States uh, that, that were supposed to uh, be in place through 2025. Uh, we think this could provide some mild relief for OEMs, but not probably a broad relief because at the end of the day, the auto manufacturers have global supply chains. They have global models now. Um, there's, so, so they don't want to have inconsistency and the rest of the world is not rolling back these regulatory standards. Um, and even in the U.S., you're still going to have a fight between states. California says they're not going to move back and many, many northeastern states follow uh, California as well. So 20% of the auto market in California and these other states that are not going to roll back the standards uh, are, are, are going to make it difficult for automakers. Are they going to make a steel car and an aluminum car? or are they just gonna go ahead and move forward knowing that probably long term you're gonna end up with these, uh, these standards coming in, whether it's 2025 or 2030. Obviously, uh, we are in the biggest bull run uh, in the auto space uh, since uh, the creation of the automobile. So at some point, we're gonna see a recession, we're gonna see a pullback in auto builds and that's gonna have some impact, uh, uh, obviously, on our business. We uh, counter that with a, a good, uh, diverse portfolio with Beverage Can. And then, you know, probably a lot of you have seen some of the <laughs> trade wars going on, the tariffs that have come on to steel and aluminum. We're not in favor of these tariffs, by the way. Um, we think they're the wrong uh, solution. We think that the issue is China and should be dealt with at the China border with allies, not just U.S., but bring other countries in because the rest of the world is acting responsibly. And so to, to, to make this just about the U.S. and China, we think is, uh, is the wrong message. Uh, there's also been some sanctions uh, on Russian oligarchs um, and specifically on the uh, largest aluminum producer outside of China, uh, which is, you know, uh, really putting a lot of um, chaos into the aluminum market. Um, actually, aluminum prices are skyrocketing right now, uh, and that's not good for our, uh, uh, obviously, our customers or long term viability of penetration of aluminum for other, uh, other metals. We think that's more short-term lived, we'll get through that, but certainly something big that we're dealing with now. So as we think about headwinds and, and, and how we take these on at Novellus, uh, and what, what is it that we do to continue to differentiate ourselves to be competitive 
um, and to weather these type of storms. We break it down into three, uh, three fundamental things that we have to continue to be focused on. And the first one's innovation. We have to continue to innovate alongside our customers day in and day out. We have to understand where they're going. We have to get better with our products. We have to continue to do what we've done for decades and create the next alloys, the lighter alloys, the safer alloys, the more formidable alloys for, for automobiles so that we can stay a step ahead of some of our competition, primarily steel. But it's not just about big innovation with our customers. It's also about what we talk about is everyday innovation. Every process has to get better. Everything we do from a manufacturing standpoint, everything we do from a functional standpoint, whether it be finance or HR, how do we get better day in and day out and make this a competitive advantage for Novellus on a long-term <coughs> basis? And part of that, and the second big theme that we think will differ, continue to differentiate no, Novellus if we think five years out, it's this world of digitalization. Um, we are in a very healthy place uh, versus our competition right now. And we are the ones that can invest heavily into this digitalization. And, and many of you in this room, we've talked to you about digitalization already. Um, it means something different to every company. Um, what we know at Novellus, it's very much about um, getting more out of our operations for our customers. We want to focus at the operations, at the shop floor, whether it be uh, with uh, advanced robotics, whether it be with um, uh, data collection that we can share on a real-time basis with our customers to make their plants more efficient so that we can be stickier with our customers on a long-term basis. Um, it's it's um, AI machine learning so we can make sure that the quality of our products uh, are, are the best quality uh, in the industry uh, delivered to our customers. So it's many, many things and we're starting this journey, but we truly believe that if we do this right and we get it right, we put the right processes in around digital, that this will be a competitive advantage for us as we uh, move uh, two to five years out. And I'm sure many of you see the same thing. And then finally, the other is culture. Um, we've worked very, very hard at Novellus on the culture at Novellus. Every company has a culture. There's no doubt about it. Many companies just don't define their culture. And we've decided at Novellus that we're absolutely going to define the culture we want. And it's not defined by uh, a few people at the top. It's been defined with large input from a number of individuals throughout Novellus. Uh, we've worked on this um, uh, with outside help. We provide tools to uh, our employees all the way down to the shop floor on how to recognize people for uh, living our cultural beliefs. We've uh, taught them how to give focused feedback. People aren't really good at giving feedback. You know, they don't want to give feedback, and we need the feedback to get better. Um, it's a journey. We're, we're still on it. We've done it through creating what we call a set of cultural beliefs that we at Novellus expect every employee to show up to work uh, living. And um, I got to tell you, this is driving tremendous amount of value you know at the beginning and you know everyone's heard the, the saying about you know culture eats strategy it's absolutely true but 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 when we started on this journey even the Novellus employees didn't believe it they don't believe that you know at the beginning that culture really was going to drive value I got to tell you we had a leadership meeting with 150 people about a month ago and the number of times people talked about culture and what it meant to performance was un unbelievable because people have really bought into this so we've done this, and, and we put it into a unified framework, um, what, what, uh, uh, how we think about um, how we go about things, what we're focused on, where we're going, and why we're at Novellus. And it starts with the how. The how is our cultural beliefs that you can see right here, doing it right, say anything, own it, get focused, win together. These, you know, there's more behind each one of these that I can't go into today. We just don't have enough time. But that's how we show up to work. That's how we do uh, our jobs every day and expect each other to do that. The second is um, our what. Our what is our KPIs at the highest level. What are we focused, in, uh, focused on day in and day out? And for us, it's called our focus, it is called our focus five. Um, and it's about the safety uh, of our employees. We have very dangerous operations and we want to make sure every single employee goes home without any injury every day. And it's really, really important to Novellus. Second is delighting our customers, 
quality of our products, getting better from an operational excellence standpoint every, every single day, and ultimately uh, improving our return on capital employed for our shareholder. Then our vision, it's where we're going. This is the five to 10 year view of where we wanna be uh, at Novellus, and it is to lead the aluminum industry as the partner of choice uh, for innovative solutions. So several things there, we wanna stay focused on aluminum right now for the next five to 10 years. We want to keep our leadership position, and the only way to do that, we believe, is through innovative solutions and being the preferred partner to our customers. Uh, we need to hold those positions. And then finally, it's the why. Uh, it's our purpose. Um, and, and we spent a lot of time on purpose over the last year, year and a half. And um, I know, a lot, you know many companies go out purpose, and many companies go out purpose in different ways. The way we did it and the way we believe in purpose is not about a tagline. It's not about uh, an, an executive committee um, uh, putting something out and saying, this is our purpose. It has to be excavated from, uh, from, from the community of employees. It has to be authentic. It has to be who the company is when it's at its best. And so we interviewed thousands of people and employees, did workshops, understood going back into history, how we have shown up, how we are the best uh, at what we do. We correlated that with, you know, what is our purpose in society as a whole? Uh, what does Novellas do um, uh, for society? Um, and, and how does that blend together? What we do know, um, and, and statistics absolutely prove it, if you just look, you know, uh, at, at recent surveys, 87% of employees are disengaged worldwide at work, 87%. 52% are actually just completely checked out at work. I mean, think about those stats. <laughs> and without an engaged workforce, you know, you are not going to get what you want uh, out of your business. And so what we know that, we know that this intersection of personal purpose and corporate pur purpose, if you can get that right, employees will be engaged. And um, you'll get, you know, more innovation. You'll get more ownership you will get more performance out of your business. And what we do know is that employees do not want to uh, work for a company that only has uh, and only is concerned about the bottom line. They want more. I and mean, you see that with everyone coming out of school today. So we've gone through this journey. We actually are just launching uh, our purpose and starting to cascade it down to our 11,500 employees. But in doing that, part of, the, part of it is creating a story um, and making sure people understand the story of Novellus. So um, we have a film um, that we've created to kind of share that story of who Novellus is and what our purpose is in, uh, purpose is in society uh, as a whole. So what I thought I'd do is share uh, with you this morning that video um, and then afterwards uh, uh, be open to any of your questions. So um, please, if you could go ahead and uh, roll the video. What's your alarm clock? What gets you rolling? At Novellus, we understand that each day is the start of something new, something novel. With each day and each small act, we make a big impact. It's a chance to come together and care together, to conquer new frontiers, to take whatever we can dream up and turn it into something real, something that can shape the future. When we look toward the horizon, we see everything we're working to preserve. Our great big round world, spinning, rolling, moving forward and we're going to improve it. Working together with our partners, we supply the inspiration to invent, the means to move, and the material to shape a more sustainable world. We pioneer, provide, and protect. Each of us doing our part to sustain the whole.
knowing that each small step we take helps the world move forward. That's why we extend capabilities and extend a hand. Why we shape new approaches, new innovations, new inspirations that will sustain our company and the planet for generations to come. Why we work together, passing the knowledge, the smiles, the heart, the soul, and the torch around the world. From every small part to the big picture, from sunup to sundown to sunup, we shape what's next for those who come next. That. I think there's mics that are um, out and about and uh, happy to, to take anything, uh, any questions that's uh, on any of your minds. Uh, good morning. I don't know if I need this. Uh, uh, good morning, Steve. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, great job. It's been amazing since you stepped in as a CEO to truly watch the transformation in your, in your company. It's not just words on the page. So. Congratulations. Uh, I think there are a lot of young people in the room that are, you know, thinking about their future. And from your role as a CEO in the war on talent, what are the, the kind of skills you're looking for in the next five years to continue the success of your company? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of different skill gaps that, that we monitor uh, on a real time basis um, and don't necessarily have all the solutions for it. One is a, a technical skill gap at our plants um, and and in the communities that that we are in uh, are not necessarily the most attractive uh, places for people to go to work in and so finding just alone uh, the technical capabilities and then getting them uh, into our uh, uh, manufacturing facilities is a difficult thing so we work in each community with different community colleges and different uh, adv adv advocacy programs to try and foster at an early age uh, more of the, the technical talent. The second area um, that we're starting to, to really move towards is, you know, kind of this data, anal data analytics uh, roles that we believe um, are going to be needed across the board uh, throughout uh, uh, Novellus as we move into this new digital world. And that's something where we think that um, uh, the skill set coming out of um, schools will be very important, but also we think it's a skill set that can be um, applied to a number of people that are already um, in the workforce today, people that were previously uh, CI experts, black belts, and so forth, can apply a lot of those same skills towards data as well. So that will be another area that, that, that we certainly are, are moving, uh, moving into as well. Steve, you mentioned about the tariffs and how that's caused the price of aluminum to skyrocket. Would you talk more about the justification of the tariffs, which was the, the uh, defense industry and how it's important to the country, and then what it's actually done and how, how that uh, uh, affects you all yeah. as far as uh, prices and so forth? Yeah. You could not run one of these large manufacturing plants with just defense material. You need to have a healthy um, aluminum industry as a whole in order to ensure that you can produce the defense products that, that the, US, uh, the United States uh, needs for, for protection. So we went at Wilbur Ross in that mindset. Um, we also went at it with, by the way, 97% um, of all the employment in the United States is downstream aluminum manufacturing, not smelting of aluminum. Primary aluminum is not spilling into the country from China. That is not what's occurring. But if we don't address at the border of China the issue of overcapacity, what will happen is that overcapacity of primary aluminum 
will move down into beverage cans, into auto, into defense, you know, into the defense space, and then it will be at our door, at, at our doorstep here in the United States. We've seen it with foil, we've seen it with other products. That's what we wanted to protect, and what we were advocates of is that use 232 as a tool to start to negotiate with China, uh, with other uh, countries and uh, allies. We actually believe the way they went about doing it is absolutely wrong. It does not, is not effective at all. Actually, 10% on aluminum does not make China any less competitive. Um, it's, it's on the margin not going to make a difference. And that's why you, you didn't see aluminum prices rise once they put the tariffs in uh, on 232, especially after they exempted Canada, which is where all the aluminum really comes into uh, for, for Novellus and many other companies. Um, Not sure where we'll end up on the tariffs uh, overall, but, but certainly we've been vocal that we, we don't think that was the right way to approach it, um, and there's probably a better solution. What's really occurred with the rising in prices is more recent, which is the sanctions uh, of uh, the Russian oligarchs and specifically this Rusal. That is 13% of the world's, um, uh, outside of China, 13% of the world's uh, aluminum uh, that no one can buy now. If you're a U.S. affiliate, which basically any global company and the far-reaching implications of anyone touching Russian metal right now is a problem. So all of a sudden, 13% of supply has gone out of the market. We've got these tariffs on, um, and now prices, uh, I just saw this morning, I mean, they're up, I think, uh, from, from a week and a half ago, they're up 30%. So it, it, it's a problem, and the industry is going to have to work through how that metal gets replenished back in, uh, in the supply chain. Most likely, unfortunate, again, to how this all works, Russia with uh, um, strategic alliances with China, that metal will probably go from Russia into China. China will um, disguise it. There will be a bigger gap between what the Chinese sell for and what the rest of the world sells for, and that metal will come back out into the market via China. <laughs> so it's, um, it's interesting, but time, we, we need time to work through it. Quick question for you here. Yeah. And I stole the microphone after him. <laughs> um, I was just curious about the, the Rusal that you mentioned. I read about it. And um, as far as the PR side of things, I mean, how do, and I'm putting this very blandly and probably too funny, but, you know, how do you come into someone as big as, you know, Rusal that y'all have the relationship with and just say, hey, sorry about this. We're going to be out for a while, but we'll be back. You know, how, how does that, what does that whole conversation look like? And how do you, you know, and, and if you get my, angle yeah. on my question. I'm just curious, how does that work? And because knowingly, you'll probably be back, in yeah. other words. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty easy conversation because the United States Treasury Department is seizing all funds. And so the first call was from Rusal to us saying, do not pay us because we know where those funds are going to go. So right now, stop paying us. We're okay with that. At the same time, since we can't get any money in the door, we're going to stop producing immediately uh, for Novellus in this case, and they probably had the same conversation with everyone. So it, it, it was, you know, absolutely uh, straightforward from that standpoint. Now it's all the secondary because the way, me way aluminum works is it works through a lot of trading houses. So a Glencore, a Tra Trafigura, all these that bought Russian metal are sitting on it in warehouses. Um, and as we're buying from those individuals, getting the clarity to make sure that we're not getting Russian metal now is a, a, a more difficult conversation uh, to have because they're trying to unload all that. At the same time, no one wants to take it either. Um, because we're the largest aluminum buyer in the world, uh, we've got preferential positions as Novellus with Trafalgar and Glencores of the world where the, you know, we think you know, we'll be okay, but others are going to get caught in, uh, caught in this. Briefly, excuse me, you briefly mentioned your R&D facility up, up in Kennesaw. Maybe talk about it. You, know, you see the rolls of aluminum coming down the, in your plants on the video. Talk a bit about you know, how you uh, develop aluminum beverage can versus truck. Yeah. Some of the science that goes into that. Yeah, so uh, the, the, the global, re we do have um, research facilities around the world. So this is just one of uh, many, many research facilities. 
And certainly the, the first thing is to work with our customers and, 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 and bring insight into insight from our customers of where they want to go. What kind of strength of uh, metal do they need? So what you'll hear is uh, a lot of, uh, in the auto side, um, right now we're, we're at what's called 6,000 grade alloys. Um, they want to go to aerospace size uh, grade alloys at 7,000 and higher. And why? Because it brings uh, more strength, less weight, uh, to these vehicles, so again, the the uh, ability to put um, safer structures into the cars with lighter uh, metals is is so important. The other part with uh, autos is just joining, right? We we know that probably aluminum intensive vehicles aren't going to be the way that everyone's going to go. Ford made a strategic decision to go to aluminum intensive. Jag Land Rover has gone aluminum intensive, but it'll be a mixed materials. So the other is. Um, this joining capability with other materials on a vehicle becomes very, very important and something to work on. So we do it with pilot lines. We have, you know, a number of different uh, pieces of equipment that we that, that we go at this with. We try and partner with um, other research uh, facilities, whether it be educational research facilities, uh, or even uh, what we're trying to push now is with understanding that the competition is steel and not aluminum. We're trying to bring a consortium together around technology uh, between us and you know some of those uh, other names uh, that you saw on that uh, competition slide. Over the years, we have moved our dollars from you know kind of uh, m probably more equivalent of can and auto and some specialties. Really, we've moved it pretty far away from can, unless the con the can customers are coming to us and really wanting to push on aluminum bottles that you see or. Um, uh, you know, different shapes and sizes. We've kind of moved our dollars of what we're trying to do away from that and only, do, only uh, kind of innovate in that area with our customers push. Where on auto, we're absolutely always pushing for the next uh, level uh, innovation as it relates to where, where we can take uh, our alloys. Hey Steve, uh, great presentation. I'm a current MBA student and consultant for Adobe. Um, you, talk, you mentioned aluminum will continue to be the focus five to ten years. Uh, I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about the growth strategy given that kind of maintenance uh, mindset in the aluminum space and then beyond. Uh, is, it, is it new uh, markets on the customer side uh, outside of cans and, and auto or is it, uh, is it on the, your production side outside of aluminum what, where you could see Novellus going? Yeah. So the, the, biggest the biggest growth that we see um, inside aluminum is uh, absolutely the penetration of aluminum onto automobiles uh, today. I mean, it's a fraction. Um, and when you look at you know, just the uh, projections by third parties that talk to auto manufacturers day in and day out, the significant um, increase in aluminum over between now and 2028 is some 42%. I mean, it's huge. And quite frankly, the aluminum space can't actually probably invest quick enough to actually meet some of the demands that's coming on the auto side. So that's, that will continue to be our growth over the next five to ten years for sure um, as we look at it in the, uh, in the aluminum space. Um, the, the others is, uh, that we think about is different forms of, of aluminum, whether it be um, right now we're completely uh, all flat roll products, so coils and rolled. Um, but what about going into extrusions and is there a complement of extruded parts um, and flat roll pro parts that you could take to customers such as auto customers and have a different value proposition if you had them both um, uh, in-house and, and, and approaching them. Um, we've kept it, you know, um, in the space of aluminum right now um, uh, versus going into other materials because we still think there is still a lot of growth there. Although, as, as we think of inorganic opportunities, so to consolidate further the industry, you saw our size and position both against our competition, against <clears throat> the various markets that we're in, there is antitrust uh, issues with just inorganic growth that we always have to work through as we, as we think about those opportunities too. Steve, can you, can you talk a little bit about the, the ownership structure and how your, your partners in India provide a better advantage? Yeah. So um, one thing I didn't touch on, Dean Ayers did touch on it, um, in 2007 we completed the sale. We were a public company after being spun off from a Canadian company called Alcan. Alcan was the competitor Alcoa. The names, they were actually one company a long, long, long time ago. So Alcan is Aluminum Company of Canada, Alcoa is Aluminum Company of America. 
Um, <clears throat> we were spun off before I came to the company, um, ran into a, a, n a number of issues, um, ended up being approached by a few uh, competitive players and, and ultimately sold uh, the company to our Indian parent company, Hindalco, uh, which is part of a big conglomerate called the Aditya Birla uh, Group, uh, about 50, uh, 50, $55 billion conglomerate. Um, we are the largest company. We're the most global company inside the group. Um, uh, the competitive advantage, um, uh, I think, comes from access in Asia uh, for us uh, to, to, to different markets and different consumers. Um, and it comes with uh, um, the fact, the matter is that they are a large metal um, producer, aluminum producer inside of India. So when we think about some of the stuff that's going on with Rusal today, we have the ability to backward integrate into actually getting that metal source too. Um, so that's a couple of the areas um, uh, that, that, you know, really provide some uh, differentiation and competitive advantage for, for having that ownership. Very, pa I mean, I, what I'd say, um, very patient owners, uh, very long-term focused. Um, so it's not a private equity model and it's not a public model. And that allows you to invest $2 billion where if we were a public company, we were no way would we invest that $2 billion. Um, and, and so there, there's distinct advantages of having the ownership structure that we, we, we do have. Steve, um, and this may be a follow on the gentleman's question over there about strategy and moving forward, but curious why you're not focusing on aerospace, um, and that may just be ignorance on my part, but it seems like there's a lot of aluminum and airplanes and other things that we tend to send off, off the ground. Just curious as to why yeah. you're not looking at that market. Yeah, so um, aerospace is a very interesting market, aero and kind of the defense market. Um, we were prohibited when we were spun off from Alcan of being in that space for five years. So that, that was one, um, uh, one, one issue. Um, all aerospace aluminum is made by four companies uh, in the world. Uh, it is very uh, sophisticated uh, product. Um, it's not something that you could do from a greenfield standpoint, so you definitely would have to buy into that in an inorganic move. But aerospace is not, uh, it's not as big a market as you might think it is. It's only 400 KT, so we do 3,200 KT on an annual basis. Uh, we'll be at 1,000 KT, just our share in auto. Uh, the entire global market for aerospace is roughly just shy of 400 KT. It's got good margins, but it's not really a growing business, though, either. It's growing at 1%, 2% over the next 5 to 10 years. So the way we think about it is if we were to do an inorganic move and get Aero, it's a nice badge to have. Um, it probably helps with technology transfer into auto. Um, and so there are some benefits there. But going after Aero, um, uh, just, just for Aero, it's not you know, a hugely... Uh, uh, attractive growth market that, 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 that we see there. Defense would be maybe something uh, different um, if we were to get into defense. Yes? Yeah, um, carbon fiber got a lot of um, play five years ago. Uh, uh, BMW had bought, uh, actually tried to backward integrate into a carbon fiber uh, facility. They since are changing that strategy a little bit. I think a lot of what we hear from the OEMs is the manufacturing of uh, manufacturing with carbon fiber is very, very difficult, very, very expensive. And so where we see carbon fiber going is more in very unique parts uh, on a vehicle on very high-end vehicles. Um, we don't see carbon fiber really on a number of the vehicles that I showed you today, and we really don't see that probably occurring um, kind of over the next uh, 10 years. And, and so there's many surveys out there of what uh, auto manufacturers believe is the right material to work with, and aluminum um, always comes out on top. Steel is actually the fourth choice. Um, carbon fiber is ahead of steel, though. <laughs> Steve, we know how important your vision statement is to drive the culture and I guess also the behaviors of the people. Can you talk a little about how that vision statement was co-created or was it an original thought or was it the full team? How was it? What was the order? Yeah, so if you think of the, um, the unified framework there, 
uh, both purpose um, uh, and the culture kind of sandwiched between were widely um, created throughout uh, uh, many, many people's input. Uh, the vision itself, because it is a five to ten years, it's really tied to strategy. We kept that to a smaller group, and really it was um, what we would call, um, and you know, the uh, executive committee uh, at Novellus. So we didn't think that we needed to get a lot of uh, further input outside of the strategy group and the, and the executive committee of really stating where we wanted to be. Where we thought it was most important is making sure it tied into purpose, and the, the link was there, and how it tied into our cultural beliefs and where we're going there. Um, but, but that input, that further input on culture and purpose, we think really allows us to cascade and really uh, allow culture to be um, really um, from the bottoms up felt first and not this this is just a top-down exercise by the executive team and, and it's worked very well Hello. Um, Stephen uh, Rich Casanova with the Pro Business Channel Studios here in Buckhead actually we're just a neighbors right around the corner from you so we welcome you to walk over over to the studio we'd love to have you continue the conversation um, <clears throat> We just launched International Business Radio in our studio, and um, actually, you're probably familiar, World Trade Day is happening here in a couple of weeks here in Atlanta. So I'd like to ask you a couple of international questions regarding to, on that point. Is first, um, what percentage of your current business is in international, uh, and as well as in that five to 10 year plan, is that a, a place that you want to move into and expand into? And then finally, what are the challenges and opportunities moving into those international markets? Um, so 65% of our business is outside of uh, uh, the U.S. or North America. So a, a wide amount of our business is already um, uh, in Asia, uh, South America, and Europe. Um, as we think about growth uh, in, in uh, all of our markets, we see growth here in the United States, but primarily in the auto sector, um, the continued uh, penetration there. But really when we think about uh, growth from a consumer uh, standpoint, whether it be beverage cans or other products, it's really outside of, uh, of the U.S. So we see growth in South America, Asia, um, and, and having a parent company in India really helps us think about, you know, uh, even a further step into India as well. So when we prioritize dollars, we, have in, we are investing in North America for auto, but I would guess that the majority of our dollars uh, will be spent from a growth standpoint outside uh, of the U.S. because that's really where, where we see a lot of the growth. What's the challenge? Um, the challenge of it is um, you know, a lot of the political dynamics that are going on right now. So specifically where we want to invest is in China. Um, uh, uh, the overcapacity that sits in China to begin with and how we think about being, uh, being able to compete with Chinese competition in five to ten years based on how they kind of think about uh, their markets uh, is very difficult for us to kind of wrap our heads around and figure out what we really want to do there. Uh, we are in China today. Uh, we believe that we, it's the fastest growing market. I mean, it's the biggest auto market, by the way, uh, in the world with 25 uh, million vehicles uh, being produced on an annual basis versus here in the U.S. of 17 million, and it's growing. So we do want to be there, but the challenge is how are you there uh, in, 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 in you do it on a standalone basis, do you do it in a joint venture, and how do you make sure that you're going to be competitive in five to ten years uh, if you're going to invest significant amounts of money in China? So you come from the CFO role, a financial background. Um, as you moved into the CEO role and, and really took on these big things like culture, what books or mentors or peers did you look to to kind of flesh that out? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, it, so because I came from the financial uh, financial place, the one thing I knew is that I was never going to be the operational um, person, right? I'm not going to go in and tell someone how to operate one of our plants. I had to make sure that I have other people to do that, and that's okay with me. And so you start to figure out where you're going to um, kind of drive a, a big organization like this. And, and certainly strategy and culture um, bubble to the top um, uh, as it relates to that. Um, many people inside the company that, that I was able to um, uh, work with around the thoughts of culture. Um, uh, Good to Great is a, a great book um, that, that uh, started this. Uh, the other book that, um, and it's one of our culture beliefs that really kicked this off is a book called Say Anything. 
um, and I highly recommend uh, that, that as a read as well. And we had worked with a group previously about um, five years ago called Partners in Leadership. And they'd come in to help us with one of our leadership programs. And having that connection to that, to that group um, helped in kind of framing what we wanted to do and then bringing them in as a resource. So it was a mix of, of, of different things. Um, but I will say over the, the three years that I've been CEO, probably the biggest passion I've had is around culture and, and the belief that I have that culture will drive performance. And if you have that mindset and you believe that, driving culture is so important at a company um, to, to, to get the right performance out of it. Alloy level, um, and I know you mentioned on like a daily processes. So are you looking at more employees for Six Sigma training, or new employees with master black belts, or more at the plant level with like automation processes, or more integration with technology, new technologies? What's kind of the biggest sector that you're focusing on as far as like innovation at that level? Yeah, it, it um, the. Innovation where we think it'll pay off the quickest is at the plant. So it's the automation, it's the data analytics, it's those type of individuals that we want to, to get into the organization or retrain people into the organization for sure. Um, uh, as it relates to you know more uh, black belts and Six Sigma, we, we just want to train our people in um, everyday innovation and, and not making innovation more than it, it needs to be, right? Um, a lot of times it's just taking the problem and thinking about it from a different place than we normally come to and bringing someone else into the conversation and really, you know, if you have five people that have worked on one piece of equipment for their whole life, they probably aren't going to see it differently than if you brought in someone from a, a, another department or another area and then reframe the problem and think about it differently. So a lot of it is we want to keep it simple. We don't want to make it into these huge, grandiose, um, pr outside of digitalization, we don't want to make it into these grand, grandiose, you know, Six Sigma black belts. We have plenty of those uh, individuals already in the company. And it's just retraining kind of the mindset as it relates to everyday innovation in, 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 at Novellus. Where we need experts and help is around that digitalization platform, and, and we're seeking a lot of help there. Uh, just the perception of you know a, a obviously not an old line uh, business and but now moving forward it seems like you can't escape the concerns around just the millennials and um, and also all these all these discussions around job displacement you know via automation and so on I'm just curious how do you think about that uh, millennials and and um, and jobs moving towards more automation as you're you know over the next five years I mean how how do you from the CEO see yeah think about that. Um, it, it's a challenge because it's, um, if you think about a new facility that's being built today, and this is why when you get back to believing employment was coming back with tariffs, it's just not the case. I mean, the only, in the aluminum sector, the only facilities that are starting up are the ones that are idle, that they can start very quickly. It's a trade. It's not really for long-term employment. I hate to say that because it's, you know, uh, within our industry, but, it, but it's absolutely true. When you see new facilities come on, uh, on stream, and we've seen examples of these, a facility uh, uh, of our size that would traditionally have um, probably six to 800 employees in that facility can now be run, and we've seen it, with 14. So it is, a, it is a big challenge because you need the automation. You need to go in that direction for many, many reasons. But how do you transition over the next five to 10 years um, your current employee base uh, as well as then bring on uh, what you need uh, uh, in the workforce? Um, probably, you know, just based on where our manufacturing facilities are, you know, we're already seeing a shortage of, you know, employment come in anyway. So from, from that standpoint, you know, it'll help us from that transitional uh, standpoint. And, and quite frankly, our old facilities, we can't go, that's a greenfield facility that can go to 14. So we'll never get there with the, with the old machines that we have today. But um, not just for us, but for all companies, it's gonna be a real challenge um, as it relates to, you know, this transition of skill sets and, 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 and where employment's really gonna go. 
Stephen, one quick follow-up question. Uh, oh, yeah. You remember me, Rich Castano, yeah, Pro-Business yeah. Channel? <laughs> yeah, I'm back again, yeah. So quick question is, um, what, what drives you when you take off your CEO, CEO hat? What's your, some fun things that you enjoy doing? And then finally, what some philanthropic efforts that you're involved in? Yeah, so uh, philanthropic um, uh, habitat uh, for humanity on a personal level, cure for, uh, uh, cure for childhood cancer is another one uh, that, that I'm very much involved in. Um, fun, I've got two young daughters, uh, 13 and 10, um, and it's just traveling with them. We're gonna go to Hawaii this summer, um, and uh, just, you know, they're at ages where I probably won't get that opportunity for much longer, so, you know, that's where I stay focused at right now. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, thank you so much for being here today uh, to commemorate your uh, speaking with us today. We've got a nice red and black sculpture for you by That's Loretta Ebing. Thank beautiful. you so much for sharing your time today and really a very informative presentation of Ellis, everything that you're doing and tremendous success that you've had and the company's had. So thank you very right. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We would love to pay for your parking today. So if, we, uh, if your parking has not been validated, please make sure that it is on the way out. And hope everyone has a fantastic Thursday afternoon and look forward to seeing you back on May 17th. Thank you.